Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 23rd, 2016. First up, this one's from PopSci.com, the website for popular science. Does coffee give you a different buzz than tea? 89% of American adults regularly consume caffeine according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Two-thirds get it from coffee, one-sixth from tea, and the rest from soft drinks. People tend to assume caffeine is the only stimulant in those beverages, but tea and even hot cocoa contain other compounds thought to have psychoactive effects, and their levels of stimulation vary. I know I don't get a kick out of anything better than I get a kick out of coffee. I, I like tea, I like soda, everything like that, but it says here, caffeine is still the most intense stimulant. It blows the others out of the water, says Crystal Haskell Ramsey, a nutritional psychologist at Northumbria University in England. But caffeine doesn't act alone. Tea, for example, contains the amino acid Theanine. In 2008, Haskell Ramsey showed that subjects who took large doses of caffeine and theanine together felt more alert than if they had taken them separately. The subjects also had better reaction time and working memory. A follow-up using smaller doses compared to the amount in cup of tea found the opposite. Theanine killed the caffeine buzz. I think it's dose-specific, so coffee, they did it right. But I still like my tea and coke. As usual, all the links to all the stories will be just below in the descriptions. Uh, this next one is from sciencenews.org. Having worms can be good for the gut. Parasitic worms may hold the secret to soothing inflamed bowels. And boy, do we have a lot of people now with that kind of a problem, too. And especially you get older, too, all the different symptoms of irritable bowel disease and things like that. In studies of mice and people, Parasitic worms shifted the balance of bacteria in the intestines and calmed inflammation. Researchers report online April 14th in Science, learning how worms manipulate microbes and the immune system may help science devise ways to do the same without infecting people with parasites. I know they use all kinds of things like from leeches to, I don't know what all they use, different kind of creatures and stuff like that and uh, methods to help with disease and infections and stuff like that. So. Uh, all in all, it might seem a little bit something to be squeamish about, but not much different than any other. Uh, it says here, previous research has indicated that worm infections can influence people's fertility as well as their susceptibility to other parasite infections and to allergies. Inflammatory bowel diseases also are less common in parts of the world where many people are infected with parasitic worms. Could also be, too, because it builds up your immune system is what I'm thinking. But Ping Loki, a paras Parasite immunologists at the New York University School of Medicine and colleagues explored how worms might protect against Crohn's disease. I have friends that have Crohn's disease, so I'm aware of that. The team studied mice with mutations in the NOD2 gene. Mutations in the human version of the gene are associated with Crohn's in some people. The mutant mice developed damage in their small intestines, similar to that seen in Crohn's patients. Cells in the mice's intestines don't make much mucus and more bacteria. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this right. Bacterioids vulcatus bacteria grow in their intestines and in the guts of normal mice. Loki and colleagues previously discovered that having too much of that type of bacteria leads to inflammation that can damage the intestines. So we may be putting more little critters to work helping us out with uh, intestinal problems. Although we already knew that worms could alter the intestinal flora, they show that these types of changes can be very beneficial, says Joel Weinstock, an immune immune parasitologist at Tufts University Medical Center in Boston. And last up from the pages of Popular Mechanics, and before I start with this one, let me just do a shameless plug here. I don't get any money from them, but I am a fan of Popular Science and Popular Mechanics, both excellent magazines. Very worthwhile for the, for the low subscription cost. I think most times, uh, if I look for specials, I can get the Popular Science magazine for about a dollar an issue, the Popular Mechanics for slightly more. Uh, well worth it, but even if you don't get them that way, go on the internet, go to popsci.com or go to popularmechanics.com. And uh, there's still probably about 80% of what you get in the magazines is available online. So support them that way if nothing else. So anyway, from popularmechanics.com, the C-130 just never dies. Lockheed Martin is building a new civilian version of the long flying cargo plane. The C-130, as a matter of fact, was first um, flying one year before I was born in 1955 and still going strong, never been out of production in uh, Marietta, Georgia. I guess they've been building them on and on all the way up to the Super Hercules, but a little bit from the article here. And I'll also give you a link to a video right after. Lockheed Martin started building its latest civilian version of the iconic C-130 Hercules in Marietta, Georgia earlier this week. 
the company's new LM100J will bring the advancements of the C-130J Super Hercules to civilian operations such as the United Nations. The C-130 just never dies. Why? Because almost no other aircraft can do what the Herc does best. Reliably haul outsized loads into and out of short, rough airstrips in the middle of nowhere. You will see in the video that I'm going to link to here that they can also outfit this with special type of rocket packs too, to where it can take off in very short airfields too, if need be, to get in and out of uh, airstrips that other planes can't necessarily do that and haul as much cargo easily. They obviously did its design right, says Tom. Weatherall, director of LM100J Business Development for Lockheed Martin. It's been in production for 60 years. It's got a high wing. It's a turboprop. The engine's propellers are out of harm's way. The straight wing yields the efficiency to get in and out of dirt runways to get the weight off the wheels as soon as possible. The fuselage is low, the fuselage is low to the ground, truck bed height, which combines with the rear loading capability. It's a configuration that's second to none. The first C-130 rolled out in 1954. Since then, Lockheed has built more than 2,500 at its Georgia assembly plant. More than 10 variants of the airplane, including AC-130 gunships and WC-130 weather reconnaissance, reconnaissance aircraft, serve U.S. and global militaries. It actually has landed and taken off on an aircraft carrier, too, although they uh, decided after that not to do it on a regular basis. But yes, the uh, military actually has versions of it to help out with the Navy and uh, they thought at one time it might be one of those uh, craft that would be a regular uh, Navy craft on an aircraft carrier, but still, um, it's used for a uh, tanker for refueling and lots of other things like that. Um, the LM100J is based on the C-130J-30, an extended version of the J that shares the same length as the L-100. Like the military Super Hercules, the LM100J gets a new Rolls-Royce AE2100 D3 turboprop engine and six-blade Dowdy R391 propellers. The airframe features a new center wing box. The cockpit, cockpit comes with full authority digital engine control, which eliminates the need for a flight engineer, a significant cost savings. So although it looks much like the original, pretty much every part of the aircraft has been kept up to date with the latest technology when necessary. So um, the new engines and props yield a 24% increase in thrust and 15% increase in fuel, of, fuel efficiency. Um, I know years ago they already had made them efficient enough to where it could cross the Atlantic without refueling but right now the L100 could fly 1800 nautical miles with a 35,000 pound cargo load and LMJ 100J will haul the same load 1000 nautical miles farther so that's 2800 nautical miles uh, if they get much better they think it probably cross the Pacific after that but anyway if you get a chance check out those articles and I will leave a link to YouTube this is somebody posted as long as it's up it's been up for a while so I'm hoping YouTube doesn't pull it down but if you watch the wings channel they have a series called great planes that feature different ones of the airplane now this doesn't go all the way up to the model J it goes all the way up to the model H just before the J but this is great planes Lockheed C-130 Hercules 45 minute documentary and very good watching especially if you're into airplanes so anyway that's about it for this week take care everybody I will catch you next week